when he's sitting there with Zoil and Mallory. <laughs> he's going to turn to the scripture and they turn on their phone to turn to the, to the passage. One day we'll be doing that. Well, turn in your phones to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Or open, turn on your Kindles and turn to a passage. It's amazing, the technology today and how we're able to do so many great things. Here we are in this wondrous passage by Paul. And I know I always say, every time I'm preaching for Paul, I always say, look at the wondrous passage by Paul. But this is a tremendous passage. It speaks about, of course, the importance of prayer. And, of course, the importance of prayer for all human beings that they will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. But we see that Paul begins his idea of praying for everyone. The importance of lifting up prayer, especially for the leaders of our nations, the leaders of our world. Because if they come to know the Lord, what a tremendous effect that will have. Think about it. If all our leaders came to know Jesus, first of all, it is a great thing for them. It is the blessing of their eternal souls and where they will spend eternity. But it's also beneficial for the people of God. Because when we have men and women who are godly, who are Christian, leading us, we know that the principles that they're seeking to enact are principles that are in accordance with the Word of God. And how great that would be for the people of God. When we have people who serve in political office who are not believers, we know how difficult that can be. And people that come from nations where Christianity is frowned upon completely, and they have such an animosity towards believers, they have to do things in hiding. They have to do things hidden. They have to fear the authorities coming and getting them. But for the peace and prosperity of our nation, how wondrous that all our leaders would come to know the Lord. And Paul in this passage, of course, saying not only all the leaders, but every single human being. How important it is to pray that every single person come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. This is the fulfillment of the Great Commission. When Jesus left the disciples in Matthew 28, he told them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, it is important for us to be going out, or as really in the Greek what it says, as you are going, as you are traveling, as you're moving on in life, share the good news of the gospel so that people will come to know Christ. And once they know, come to know Christ, for them to take that next commitment and be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and to disciple them, to train them, so that indeed they will be grounded in the things of the Lord. But the beginning of evangelism is prayer. The beginning of evangelism is prayer. Before we head out, before we reach out, you know, before you witness to that person, pray for that person. You know, so many times you see all these Billy Graham crusades, all these great things that happen. Do you know that every time Billy Graham had a crusade, he had a prayer team that would just be dedicated to praying for the people that would be in that area for every soul. Actually, Dwight O. Moody in the 19th century, he didn't have all the great technology Billy Graham had. So he literally, there was a man who literally would go, a man, one man by himself, and literally be where Dwight L. Moody was going to preach. And he would sit there, and all he did was pray for every single soul that would pass in front of him. To pray for the salvation of every person. Evangelism begins with prayer. We need to pray for all the leaders of our nation. Now, you may not like President Obama. Maybe you do like him. Maybe you don't like him. But he, you may not like his policies. You might not like him. Whatever the case. But we need to be praying for him. We need to pray that he will come to know the Lord. And if he knows the Lord, we need to pray that the Holy Spirit will guide him. We should keep our president in our prayers. We should be lifting him up before the Lord. Possibly, if you can, remember daily to remember your leaders. Because if there's one place where an enemy is going to attack, it's the leadership. Knowing that if I can dismantle the leadership, I can dismantle everything. Like the, you know, the Bible says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Go for the head. So we need to pray for our president, that God will guide him. We need to pray for our governor, that he will know Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
that he may come for his own well-being and our own well-being. You know, of course, our governor, uh, governor uh, amazes me even more because I'm fascinated how many times, you know, you see all these things on television, oh, bullying is bad. We should not bully people. Bully is bad, bad, bad. Don't bully, don't bully. We talk about racism is bad, racism is bad. But yet, how many times do I see people referring to our governor and speaking about his obesity and making jokes and slandering him that way? No, that should not be. Isn't that bullying? Isn't that exactly what we're telling our kids not to do? And yet as adults, we do them. Remember, your children are watching you. And they see the things that are coming out of your mouth and the way you mock the president, the way you mock authority. They're going to think that's the way you think. And that it's okay to mock authority. Well, you know, if it's okay to mock authority, eventually children say, well, parental authority can also be mocked. We need to establish that sense of authority, a sense of respect. And our governor is our governor. And we need to pray for him. We need to pray for all our leaders. And of course, in this great passage, Paul talks about the salvation of all. And that's what I want to focus, the importance of seeing every single human being come to know the Lord. God wants all to be saved. Look at verse 4. Who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, Paul is dealing with people, with Jewish people, who were elitist. There were Jews, actually, unfortunately, too many Jews in the time. Very few actually believed differently. Most Jews believed that only Jews could be saved. And actually, depending on what group you're in, if you're a Pharisee, you thought only Pharisees would be saved. If you were a Sadducee, you thought only Sadducees would be saved. If you were part of the Essenes, you thought only Essenes. They were elitist. But certainly no one made room for the Gentiles, which is us. If you're not Jewish by biological birth, you are a Gentile. They made no room for us. They thought that our salvation meant that they had no desire to reach out to, to, to Gentiles and tell them the good news of salvation. They didn't want to witness to them. Nothing of the sort. And Paul says, no, 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 no. God desires all human beings to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You know, God wants your enemy. That person you don't like at work, that person you don't like at school, God wants that person saved. God loves that person just as much as he loves you. We need to be concerned about every single human being, that every single person will come to know Christ. And what a glorious thing that is, right? God wants the salvation of all. So is everybody, everybody going to get saved? Unfortunately not. We wish. We wish. Wouldn't it be great? I would love to be able to walk to hell and see a, a, a sign that says vacant. That'd be awesome. That'd be the best sign in the world. But unfortunately, God created us in a way where he gave us free will. He allowed us to choose for ourselves whether we would follow him or not. God wanted us to love him and worship him because we wanted to. Actually, you cannot love a person or worship them unless you have free will. A robot will never be able to love you. I don't care what Steven Spielberg, Spielberg movie comes out. When a program, when a computer is programmed to love you, it loves you because it is programmed to love you. If you program it to hate you, it will hate you. Robots, computers cannot love. They cannot worship. Human beings are free. And we can choose to love or to hate. We can choose to worship or to blaspheme, but it is within our powers. You know, God has prepared everything. You know, I was talking this week with somebody, I told them, God prepared everything when it came to salvation. All we have to do is accept. It's like God put on a party and he sent out the invitations. All you had to do was come. You know, Julio and Yami worked so hard this week on VBS. They did so many preparations. So many people worked so hard to put all this together. You know, what did the kids do? They either came or didn't come. They were all invited. But if they chose not to come, they didn't have to. But that's all they could do was accept the invitation or reject the invitation. God has done everything for our salvation. Everything. We had to do nothing except stand by and go, okay, thank you. That's it. That's it. Because we could not save ourselves. We cannot redeem ourselves. We are the ones stuck. We are the ones in bondage. We're the ones who are slaves. It is God who's done everything to free us. And then he turns to us and says, okay, you want to come? 
You want to be released from that bondage? You want to be released from that prison? You want to have healing in your life? Tell me. And he invites us. And it's up to us to say yes. It is so important to understand the importance of free will, that we are indeed free. It also explains why we are also fallen. Because we have chosen to disobey God. We have chosen to go our own way. I mean, if literally, if we don't have free will, the only one that can be blamed for all the evil in the world is God. You know, people say, oh, look at all the evil in the world. And I say, yeah, look at all the humans in the world. Look at them, all the atrocities that they commit. We are the ones who have destroyed everything. Oh, look at all the chaotic things that happen on our planet. Why did they happen? Because we have destroyed our planet. If we did not destroy the planet, the planet would behave normally. It would behave in a healthy way as it will one day again when God redeems it. We have destroyed everything. Now, if we didn't have free will, then certainly God would be the one to be blamed. But since we do, we are the reason that there is evil in the world. We are also the reason why there continues to be evil in the world. You know, we always look at the news and go, oh, ISIS, oh, oh evil, oh, horrible. Well, think about the hatred that you have in your heart. Think about the bitterness you have in your heart. Think about when you open your mouth to slander someone, to hurt them. The only difference between them and us is that they have weapons. And they're able to get away with what they're getting away with now, for the moment. And some people, if they really had the opportunity and really could get away with it, they would. Actually, with so many people, you see people when they commit a crime, the one thing they're thinking is, I can get away with this. I can do this. But we see just even having the thought how evil we can be. How can we have the thought to imagine ill upon another human being? No matter how horrible we may imagine them to be. How can we wish ill upon them? How can we wish any harm upon them? It's amazing. The evil that lives within our hearts. It explains why creation is the way it is. But God has brought about redemption. God has brought the solution. Again, we brought the problem. And we continue to bring problems and more problems. But the solution remains the same. It is Jesus Christ. Through him, redemption occurs. Through him, healing occurs. All creation will be renewed one day because of what Jesus Christ did upon that cross. The one author, David Bentley Hart, states it so well in his book, The, the Doors of the Sea. He says, how radical the gospel is pervaded by a sense that the brokenness of the fallen world is the work of rebellious rational free will, which God permits to reign, and pervaded also by the sense that Christ comes genuinely to save creation, to conquer, to rescue, to defeat the power of evil in all things. The great drama of the world, the great story of the world, is that human beings have fallen. Human beings have taken themselves down into depravity and they've taken creation down with them. How will they be rescued? And God, of course, brings in the nation of Israel to be a light to the nations, and he does all these great things, but ultimately it's through the seed of Abraham, through Jesus Christ. He brings redemption. Now there's hope for the world. God desires all to be saved. But not only does he desire all to be saved, the Bible says that he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11 says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. You know, God never looks at someone like Osama bin Laden and when he died said, oh, praise God. Well, can God say praise God? Hmm. Praise me. Would God say, God doesn't say that. God takes no joy in that. Not at all. We might, because we're cynical. We're fallen. We're bad. God takes no pleasure in the death of a wicked person. The only thing God takes pleasure in is that that wicked person repents of their sins and comes to know him. That is the love of a father. That's why it says here the expression, to come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants every single person to come to know the truth. What is the truth? That Jesus Christ has come and has died for the redemption of the world. And that through him we can be saved. You know, this is where we come in. We have the great privilege 
of being able to present, present Christ to the world. Do you realize that? I mean, are you never overwhelmed with the weight of glory that is on top of you? That is incredible. You hold in your tongue the power of life and the power of death. Do you know that when you're with someone and you're withholding the gospel from them, you're withholding life from them. You're purposely allowing death to reign in that person. When you can present Jesus to them and tell them the great news, to tell them the great news that Christ has come, that there is hope for them, that they can be healed, that they can come to know Christ. But of course, we can speak the word to them, but we cannot save them. Because not enough just to know that Jesus came and died, we have to accept him. And they have to come to that point as well, not only hearing the gospel, but accepting him. So Paul first tells us that God desires all to be saved. Then he tells us the doctrinal basis for that. Look at verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and human beings, the man Christ Jesus. You know, Paul is talking about the salvation of all, yet he stops to point out the importance of one God and one mediator. Why is that so important? Well, think about it. If there's one God, then there is only one salvation, only one gospel. If there are two gods, or three gods, or ten gods, then we're in trouble. Right? How do you please ten gods? You ever thought about that? People in the ancient world were going crazy about this. You know, they were being concerned that they said the right words to the right God at the right time. God forbid I need help and I need, you know, this particular God, Zeus, to help me, but I'm praying to another God instead and Zeus is the one that's near me. So they would literally go through all these prayers and all these things trying to find the right one, the right prayer. It reminds me of that the movie, the, the Mummy, where the guy is confronted by the mummy and he has all these amulets and he begins to pray, pray all these, he pray, prays a Buddhist prayer, prays this prayer, prays that prayer to, <laughs> in any way to appease the mummy, you know? And that's what it was like. And so people are still like, again, if there are many gods, it's the confusion. The Bible says there's only one God. There's only one God. All the gods of the nations are idols. They're not true gods. They don't exist. On the contrary, Paul says that behind them lies the power of demons seeking to deceive the people, seeking to deceive the nations and drive them away from the one true God. There is one God and one mediator between God and man. One gospel as well, as Paul will say. But one mediator means, again, you know, you might think that there's a billion mediators you know, but think about it. If there's only one mediator and you're spending your time praying to any other mediators, they're not going to help you. Because they can't. Because first of all, they don't exist. Because there's only one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus. He is the one we turn to because he is the Son of God. He is the one who's given himself for us. He's the one who's redeemed us. Now, the mediator, of course, is someone who would come between, you know, it sounds like a nice word, oh, mediator. But if you think about it, it's a word dealing with hostility and animosity. The only time you need a mediator is when you have two people opposing each other. And in this case, you have God and humanity. But it's not God opposing humanity. It's humanity opposing God. God is trying to bring redemption by providing the mediator to stand between them. So the mediator has to come and represent both parties. And it's exactly what Jesus does. We know that Jesus was fully God and fully man. He wasn't simply God walking among us. He was God in the flesh walking among us. So that he could represent both sides. If he was only human, he'd just be one of us. He'd be stuck in the same boat. I mean, if I try to be a mediator for you, hey, I have to be a mediator for me first. How can I help you if I can't help myself? He had to be someone like us, but then again, not be contaminated as we are contaminated. He cannot be one of the rebels. He cannot be a sinner. Indeed, he is the answer to Job's prayer. In Job chapter 9, verse 33, Job declares, if only there was someone to arbitrate between us, to lay his hand upon both of us. If only someone could come between God and me to represent us. 
And Jesus is the answer to that. In the book of Hebrews, we're told, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. But Jesus, of course, in order to be a mediator, had to do something else beyond just being someone who stands there. He literally had to become a ransom for our sinfulness. Look at verse 6. Who gave himself as a ransom for all people, the testimony given in his proper time. You know, this is, of course, what Jesus referred to in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, when he said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. It wasn't enough that he comes between. Something has to be done about what humanity has done. Humanity has sinned and violated the laws of God. Someone has to account for that. Someone has to pay for that. Jesus takes our place. He takes our punishment upon himself. All that we did falls upon Christ, falls upon the cross. Why did Jesus die the brutal death that he died? He was paying for the sins of humanity. He was paying all our sins, all our evil are placed upon him. And he takes them. And of course, he does this freely. It wasn't that God took his son and said, here, do whatever you want with him. It's that Jesus himself came forward and gave his life as a ransom for us, to purchase us, to remove us from the things that were harmful and sinful. God desires every single human being to be saved. And that is the great message that now we have. You know, Paul said here in verse 7, And for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying and a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. That is the privilege that falls upon us now. This is a glorious message. I mean, I don't know about you. Everybody's different. Everybody, I guess, responds differently. I haven't forgotten what I was before Jesus met me. And I'm not foolish to imagine that I was heading on a good path. I was heading on a bad path. I was heading on a destructive path. And I guarantee you that if I had not known Jesus, I would not be here. Not that I just wouldn't be standing here, but that I wouldn't be here. That I would have destroyed myself long ago. So how happy I was when someone came to me and cared enough, loved me enough, to tell me the good news of the gospel, to tell me about Jesus. It, the most wondrous thing in the world. And to have come to know Christ and to live in his presence and to enjoy his blessings, what a great thing. But how, how, how do I now stop and not share the message? How do I now, now not tell you the importance of sharing the message? I stand here as a messenger, as telling you, hey, this is the great salvation that God has brought into the world. God desires every single human being. Today, when you walk out, I want you to do something. You know, C.S. Lewis said, you never met a mere mortal. And what he meant by that is, every single person you meet is an eternal being. They're going to spend eternity somewhere. And if you think about that, when you meet every single person you meet today, don't discard them. Don't discard them. I don't care if it's the person at the, at the A&P, you know, doing the checkout. I don't care if it's the waitress at the restaurant. I don't care who it is. Don't discard them. When you look at them, realize that they are an eternal being. That's what you are. We're, you know, you want that kind of respect, right? You want the respect of realizing just how much you're worth, just how important you are. Well, when you look at every single human being, realize they are of the utmost importance. If they were the only one lost, Christ would come and die for them. That's how important they are. And so when you look at them, just realize the gravity of what you're looking at. You're looking at an eternal being. You know, C.S. Lewis again said, if you were to see them in their final glory, you might even be tempted to worship them. You know, like, all believers here, if we saw them in their final glory, we'd be like, wow, 
How angelic, how glorious, how majestic. Because we are created in the image of God. So when you look at them, don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. You know, here we are going to come to a table and celebrate the Lord's Supper. He gave himself as a ransom for our sins, but for the sins also of the whole world, that everyone who believes will be saved. So when you see them, maybe you have a hard time, maybe you don't know how to witness. If you don't know, you should learn. First of all, I'm here preaching to you, and I am by nature an introvert, not an extrovert. So it can be done, but you can begin by praying for them. Pray for their soul. Maybe you won't be the one to witness them. Maybe you won't be the one to share the gospel. But you can pray for that person. That God will send the right individual to share the good news with them. God desires the salvation of every single human being. Every single one of them is important to him. As if they were the only one. You see how much God loves you? That's how much he loves the person to the right of you, to the left of you, the person outside. Everyone. And he desires for every single one to be seated in a congregation worshiping him as a daughter, as a son. And we have a part in that ministry by reaching out. As we come to the table, I want us to take the gravity of that and take it with you. Don't ever look at human beings in a careless way. I don't care if they're homeless. I don't care what the case is. They are worth the blood of Christ. That means that they're extremely valuable. You cannot think any more, anything more valuable than the blood of Christ. And yet they were so loved by him that he gave himself freely for them. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your great love and mercy towards us. And Father, we know that this love of yours is not simply one that is spoken or one that is expressed. It's one that is demonstrated by the fact that you came and took on flesh. And that you are willing to die for our sins. We thank you because your love is demonstrated in all that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, and we pray that now as you come to your table, that you will just bless us with your Holy Spirit to magnify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. As we prepare for the Lord's table.